It's all about um, the flaws in the Hillary Clinton campaign. Um, um, and, and so there's all kinds of But the simple answer is, is on one level, or not so simple answer, is to say that, is that checking in on public policy uh, is not the job of, of the courts. That's the job of the American public. That's the job of Congress. Um, and here, the best check on public policy of the Trump is what? Trump himself. I mean, I mean, he he doesn't have a vision. He doesn't have um, he doesn't have a policy agenda and doesn't know how to move things. His own ineptness is going to prevent him from getting anything done. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. I want to get new hands first before I come back to others. Yeah. And two questions. <clears throat> if I'm moving out of the camera, okay, 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 okay. The first one with respect to treason. Uh, you know, the Constitution defines treason. And so, aid and comfort to the enemy, doesn't that presuppose that there must be a real enemy as opposed to one that we could speculate mm -hmm. with the Russians? Mm -hmm. We have to be almost at a time of war? Perhaps. Perhaps. And then, secondly, goes to the broader statement about faith in the system. Yeah. You have one party seemingly still trying to play by the rules. You have another party that basically obstructed an entire administration for eight years, who seems to be motivated much more by the amount of money they can, how they can game the system, Operation Crosscheck, um, voter ID, now, now setting up a system to enrich the concept of voter ID. How can we, you know, at the time of Watergate, you had a press that was interested in, that would, worked under um, uh, the Fairness Doctrine mm -hmm. and was more interested in arriving at truth, you yeah. know, in terms of Walter Cronkite and sure. um, the uh, Washington Post, was it? Washington Post, that's right. And Under um, Ben Bradley. Right. So you had a, a system in place that was there giving, checking Sure. The other systems of government, you had congressmen not necessarily going to get all their money, as much money as they need to run for re-election, and so therefore they don't have to pay attention right, to the right. electorate. That's what scares me, is that these things, the train seems to be coming off the rails sure. and in many aspects. Right, okay. A couple of thoughts here. Um, you know, first, I remember after 9-11, uh, when Hungry Mind was... The bookstore was 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 you know was still in business, um, and I gave it. Um, and was it was, was it Dave Arnowski? I, I think it was. I think it was, it was the uh, owner asked me to come over and give a talk about post 9/11, and I started off by saying, "Fear and prejudice makes us do a yeah. lot of stupid things." You know that we've got this really great side of American politics. That's wonderful. But we also have this ugly side that starts with, you know, the burning of witches in Salem, Massachusetts, that takes us through, you know, the McCarthy era, you know, to Stonewall, to et cetera, et cetera. And the reason why I mention that is that I never want to downplay the fact that there is an ugly side to American politics, and that's unfortunate. We, we have to recognize that. But the other thing, and, and, you know, and maybe I'm too Pollyannish or something like that, you know, I'm not one to panic myself, you know, is that, is that again, my point of telling the story about the day after the election, you know, coming out of care and saying to my wife, there are no tanks in the streets, there's no barbed wire up, is to say, guess what? You know, the world's not going to end. Um, um, that we survived Watergate. You know, we figured out that we survived what? The Cold War. I don't know about you, I'm 59 years old. I grew up at a point where we what? We shot John F. Kennedy, we shot Robert Kennedy, we killed Martin Luther King Jr. God, it was worse then than it is now, you know. And so, put things in perspective. I mean, I, I grew up out east. We burned half of the urban cores of the East Coast down. Um, and I just say that because we we too quickly let our fears grip us. And at some point, we have to sort of say, take a deep breath and think through what are the ways that we can actually work through this process and the way to mobilize and do a variety of different things. And so I, I start off by saying that, yeah, I come back to you. I absolutely agree that there are a lot of things wrong in our political system. There's no one silver bullet to fix any of them. You know, the closest that I would come to a silver bullet um, is as I come back to a quote that I'll give. 
uh, from somebody else. Um, back in the 90s, I was the, uh, the state president, executive director for Common Cause Minnesota. Uh, in 1998, the 25th anniversary of Watergate, I brought Archibald Cox to Minnesota to talk about um, the 25th anniversary of his firing. And I got to have the pleasure of having dinner with him. And I was talking to Archibald Cox about something, and he turned to me and he said, the rules on who can give money are the rules that determine the rules of the game. Um, and I've always loved that statement because he said def they decide how the game of politics is played. And to a large extent, um, if there's any one silver bullet, and again, I don't think there's any one silver bullet out there. The reasons why the media are not doing their job, um, um, all, they're, all, they're multifaceted. But somewhere out there, the core issue is how do we get a grip on the role of money in politics in our political system? Um, and, and that's where I think we need to concentrate. I think what, what's happening here, and I think you were sort of hitting at it here also, is, um, is that on one level, I said this during the Bush administration for many people too, that Democrats hyperventilate every time um, Bush did something. And I said, it's predictable. What, they, what he's able to do is to get you folks to hyperventilate and distract you from the eyes on the prize, to distract you from really sort of doing the things that need to be done. Out here right now, I would argue, take us away from Trump, take us into politics in a different realm. One of the things I think the Democrats are doing fundamentally wrong right now is thinking, guess what? Trump is such a screw up. We're going to win in 2018. Guess what? You still have to have what? A narrative, a message, an alternative, a candidate, a strategy. At the end of the day, give me 30 more seconds here. At the end of the day, where Trump was fundamentally correct, and I rarely will ever say something like this, is that in the last 40 years, the gap between the rich and the poor has accelerated dramatically. That both Democrats and Republicans have largely abandoned working class America. Uh, Clinton didn't have any proposals for, for working class America. Obama's policies, I would argue, largely ignored working class America also. If the Democrats think that Trump being a screw up is enough to ensure their election in 2018, they're foolish. So to me, the eye on the prize is not to get distracted by everything he's doing, it's but it's to say, what is the counter narrative? What is the counter proposal? What is the agenda and strategy that we have to take to be able to, um, 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 to take control of power um, and, and to govern? And that's where I would put the focus. You know. um, I work for a corporation where the head encourages people to write their three most important things, or their MITs, and start their day with right. their MITs every okay. day. Right. And I'm going to ask you, what can we, what would we use as our MITs to affect the change here? Wow. Good question, right? Are, these are good question here. First off, I always tell people, this is, this is my criticism okay, of, of, of local politics. I'm going to pick on St. Paul and Minneapolis politics right now. <laughs> you don't run for mayor on a platform of world peace. Um, 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 and, and our candidates seem to want to talk about world peace. Um, um, I worked in local government back in New York. Local government's about what? Streets, sidewalks, dogs, police, fire, et cetera, et cetera. So I say, First off, it's about can you clean up your own part of the world? You know, can you concentrate in terms of what? Mobilizing locally, building the bases that you want to start within the world that you can actually control. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing that, that I would actually say in terms of, 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 um, of, of, of things that we could do is it has to be about education. And I don't mean this, I don't just mean talking about funding education, it's a different story entirely. It's going to be about educating ourselves. It's going to be about educating um, others. You know, because again, one of the things that we learned from 2016 are the enormous bubbles that we all live in. Um, so that's the second thing, education. The third thing, as I say to my students all the time, is that simply liking something on Facebook doesn't mean doodly squat. Um, <laughs> uh, is, that, is that my students you know, will say, well, I'm engaged. I follow things or like something on Facebook. I said, 
Nobody cares. At the end of the day, you know, there is, there is the notion of, guess what? As Woody Allen once said, 98% of life is showing up. Uh, that you have to show up. It's voting. It's showing up, whether, whether it's the caucuses, whether it's showing up, whatever it is. It is door knocking, whatever you have to do. So none of these sound exciting because everybody wants to bring about world peace. But guess what? It's building in those small little areas that you can actually build and do something. So that was, those would be on my list of the three things that I would do. Yeah, way back there. So um, when you were talking a little bit about getting um, you know, House of Representatives on board with impeachment and everything, I mean, Yeah, yeah, it has, it has to be, because at some point, at one level, elected representatives are, are rational players. What do you mean by rational players? They want to get reelected. Mm -hmm. At some point, the calculus, the squeeze has to be there where they decide, guess what, that if I keep pursuing this particular strategy, I seriously run the risk of not getting reelected. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of districts across the country. Um, that, that Republicans are absolutely safe. You know, I've, I've, some of you have heard me on LNX say this several times, that there's only about 20 to 25 seats in the House of Representatives that are truly swing. Okay, we can maybe explode it a little bit more in a great year, put it up to about 40 or something like that. But it's not a lot of seats. We have overwhelmingly Democratic, overwhelmingly Republican. But what the focus should be, if I were doing it, is saying, let's key in on those critical swing seats across the United States. You know, we can identify 20 or 25 or so seats. And we've got two of them in Minnesota, maybe three. Um, you know, now one of them, you know, maybe four actually at this point. You know, we've got we've got you know waltzes, you know, we've got we have the eighth district, we have we have um, the second district, we have the third district. Uh, key in on especially you know Paulson's district, key in um, on, on the second district and apply the pressure there because that's what, that, those are the ones, they're probably at the end of the day, you're not gonna change their minds. Right. But those are districts for what? You can put people out of office. Um, and that's what you have to do. At some point, it's about what? It's about the electoral strategy. Now, now a lot of, you know, this is sort of my, again, my criticism from last year. My students in Hamlet, you know, and, and um, um, were, were ardent Bernie Sanders supporters as many students were across the country, and 25,000 of them would show up at a rally, 40,000 show up at a rally, but they didn't show up to vote. Um, and I would say to them, guess what? It doesn't matter if you hang out at a rally all day. You gotta show up and be counted. And so, so here at some point, it has to be the point of how do you exert the right strategies and squeeze to get people out of office and replace them in those swing districts. So my <laughs> My point is, is that, and the answer is yes. What it is, and, and then maybe it's, it's, it's partly on the impeachment. It's basically when Jason Lewis and Paulson, if they actually think they're going to lose because they're support of Trump, that's when the calculus starts to change. Now, do I think the House is actually going to impeach him? No. But what will happen? It's, I'm going to call it the equivalent of an England where there's a vote of no confidence. You know, where you get to the point where, where it is clear that the House isn't going to support you uh, uh, on, on, when it push comes to shove. That's the point where it's effectively as good as impeachment. I mean, think about it. I mean, all intents and purposes, Dixon was impeached and convicted. I mean, the pressures were there. He was ousted. Just didn't have to go through the actual process of doing it or something like that. So, pardon me? I just yeah, so so that to me is like it's, it's, it's a squeezing process. Yeah, yeah. yeah there is an organization called um, Swing Left, right? And that's, I think, where this power is. That we, we, and they're already starting activity, right? Getting people to vote and sign up for the years, register, and all that. And they're starting to put the pressure on us. And that becomes more visible, I think, that pressure right. will be seen by the Right, right, but 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 also, but still, but still, and he he, what I've been saying here, it's not just again enough to say Trump's screwing up. No, no, no. The Democrats have to alter, offer yeah. the alternative 
vision and strategy, the argument for why they should be elected. Because otherwise, what I think is going to happen in 2018 is nobody shows up to vote. So I, I get this. I worked for a CEO before, and I, I see this yeah. kind of pattern with Trump. We're uh -huh. stirring up the pot, stirring up the pot, stirring yeah. up the pot. We're all focused on this impeachment. Okay? Right. But what's flying under the radar while well, we're sitting there being focused on that? Because we've got like seven, we've got a media merger thing going on where 70 percent of our media is going to be controlled by our, our local media is going to be controlled by one company you know they're trying right. to pass a law where there's not going to be any more overtime pay I know. um and, and so we're sitting here so preoccupied with this impeachment when we're to, in order to really stand up we need to stop what's going on within our info structure because there's all kinds of stuff that we're not paying attention to because we're looking at what he's doing with Russia. So yeah, I think you make a very good mess. Yeah. He's taking advantage of that. Yeah. You make a very good point. It's my whole point about, about diversions and people getting hot and bothered about certain things. You know, it's like, again, uh, you know, I, I look at, you know, I've just about blocked out most of the timeline on Facebook now because I've gotten tired of sort of, you know, you know, you know, people just sort of again hyperventilating about absolutely every, you know, everything. Yeah, what's happening with Russia is important. But there's no question about it. But you're right. Real public policy on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of what's going on about media control and structure, um, about possibly what's going to happen with with the um, um, any kind of tax reform, things like that. Those, those, the, the, those are big issues that need to be mobilized around also and need to be worked on. And, and, and again, I think one of the things that, that we have, again, people have to be thinking about is what is that overarching message, overarching um, alternative to offer? Because, again, my criticism, of, and I've seen this too many times in my lifetime already, is, is that the Democrat strategy sometimes is to say, well, when people come back to their senses, they'll vote Democrat. Um, <laughs> um, um, that, that's not a strategy. It isn't a strategy. Yeah. Hillary Clinton's message, I thought, was anti-Trump, and that did not work oh, yeah. clearly. What would you say might be the message? Because I totally agree with you. Yeah. The Democrats have to have a message that resonates with people. But I don't know what it is. Yeah. First of all, I was going to say, if I could figure out what it was, what it is, um, I'd be working on Madison Avenue helping to craft. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I mean, clearly. Pardon me. I'll give you a hook in a minute. I can see yeah, it coming yeah. here. Uh, I mean, clearly, clearly, I think. Um, it, it, you know, I, I still think it's a message about um, economic populism. I still think at the end of the day, it's a message that talks all about um, the, the belief that most of us still want to be able to live the American dream, still want to be able to succeed at the end of the day, um, that people, you know, I mean, people want to be able to get up in the morning, go to work, send their kids to school, they want to play by the rules and feel like they can actually succeed in life or something like that. Now, I don't know how to make that sound really exciting or something like that, you know, but it's about, it's about talking about the gaps between the rich and the poor. It's about making sure that, that those who are least advantaged in our society um, are, are helped and taken care of. You know, and, and bringing it back local at this point, you know, I, I think about like the Minneapolis race or something like that for mayor. You know, is that you know in Minneapolis, you know, on one level, you know, in St. Paul, in some level too, I think you know the race is really ought to revolve around what? They ought to revolve around what? Um, um, equity, around <coughs> fairness. They ought to be revolving around the issue that we've got enormous gaps between the north side of Minneapolis you know, and the other parts, and how do we sort of you know, build linkages. So I don't know how to craft the message you know, in terms of doing it. Um, but, but that's where I think the Democrats have to go and recognize the fact that, guess what, that a lot of the Democratic policies for the last 25 to 30 years haven't, haven't really dealt with working class America, haven't helped a lot of average people. I mean, back in 2000, I know, this will be my last comment here. I'm getting the hook here right now. I'm getting the hook. Okay, so, Susan, so, uh, for Min, 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 how many of you read Mint Post? Okay, okay. Susan Albright used to be at, at, at the Star Tribune. She's now the editor, you know, managing editor at, at Mint Post. I love this story. Is that I'm, in 2010, when the Democrats are getting slaughtered, I'm working Carol Levin. I mean, I know Susan for years. And at like 10 minutes after midnight, Susan sends me an email. Um, says, David, I know you're awake. 
Uh, uh, I need from you by 5 a.m. in the morning a 700-word essay for oh, that morning on, on, on why Obama lost. And she, she said, it's by saying, and I know you'll have it for me by that time. Like, so, uh, if anybody knows Susan, you'll know. Like, when she asks you, you do it. Okay, why so, Obama lost? Um, pardon me? Why Obama lost? Why, no, no, this is 2010. This is 2010. Oh, why the Democrats oh, no. did so badly in 2010. Oh. That's what I meant to say. So, you know, why the Democrats got slaughtered in 2010. And part of what I wrote back then is something still true to this day, is that, that what the Democrats did was to take sort of what I call a wait-wait strategy. You know, for example, we bailed out the banks in 2009, but didn't bail out the homeowners. Um, 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 the, the unions asked for the passage of the Employee Free Choice Act to modernize the National Labor Relations Act. Obama was, wait, wait, I'll get to that later. Um, um, people were saying, increase the minimum wage. Wait, wait, we've got to deal with something else. And pretty much, I said, partly why, why the Democrats got slaughtered in 2010 was that is they blew off their core constituencies and said, we got something else to do, to bail out the banks, to bail out Wall Street. Um, um, you can't do that and win. They could pass the Affordable Care Act, too. They did pass the Affordable Care Act. They should have passed single payer. But, but, yeah. 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 but and this is the point what I would bring up now, um, is that the Democrats have to acknowledge that there are problems with the Affordable Care Act and say, we need to fix that, and here's how to fix it. No, I, I, I agree. They haven't suggested what they would do. That's exactly so the point. They're just like the Republicans. Exactly. Going on. Exactly. Anyhow, thank you very much. Thank you all really very much for coming. I'm Laura Davis, the chair and co-founder of Stand Up Minnesota. Um, and interesting that, that Professor Schultz touched on the idea of education, because one of the really important things that we're doing is we've created this SUM Academy, which is our Stand Up Minnesota Learning Center. And this is the second program that we've been able to present um, related to education. And so what we'd really like from all of you is if you can grab a card on the way out and write down if there are certain things that you'd be interested in learning more about. We can bring in speakers, we can bring in, you know, other other folks as talented as Professor Schultz. And we really want to hear from you about what are the kinds of things that interest you. Also, if you're not on our uh, email list, Please, on the way out, check with someone at the table to be sure that we have all of your contact information, and hopefully you're following us uh, already on Facebook, Stand Up Minnesota. Thank you all very much. We do like that. We like that. Thank you. And thank you again. All right. Did I pass the audition? Yeah. Does anybody know the, does anybody know the reference? I know. For part two. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. Yeah. 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 Yeah.